It's time to rip the cover off what really works to ditch addiction, depression, anger, anxiety, and all other kinds of human suffering. No, not sobriety. We're talking the F word here, freedom. We'll share straight from the trenches what we've learned from leaving our own addictions behind and coaching hundreds of others to do the same. And since it's such a heavy topic, we might as well have a good time while we're at it. Okay, guys, you've had a couple of weeks where the microphone got hijacked by somebody else and you've listened to the stories and questions that were brought up by Lee and Jonathan and and Tucker and Amber as they so resolutely commandeered the microphone while I was busy out running an errand for my kids. And so now we're back. And today I want to do something that we've done before, which is take some biblical passage or, or a scriptural passage, and I want to give you another way of looking at it. Um, This is one that has been on my mind for probably over a decade, and it's one that I kind of latched onto early in the beginning of thinking about some things. It was this whole idea about the tongue. Now, uh, in James chapter 3, he mentions the tongue itself as being essentially like this massive issue with the with the body. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from the new new international version. There's a lot of sort of like hellfire and damnation and stuff kind of thought processes in this. But I want to I like the metaphors that he uses because I want I'm going to take it a different direction as usual than what is normally taken. Usually people take this to mean the tongue as in the words that we speak and that's what he's speaking about here, but I want to take it a slightly different direction. So he starts here by saying Uh, In chapter 3 of James, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check, talking about discipline and whatnot. So here's the metaphors. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. And this part, you know, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Okay, you can take it that way if you'd like. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. (laughs) Anyway, keep going. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I'm laughing here because it's a really extreme language, and it's kind of true in some ways. (laughs) If you think about all of the vitriol that is shared online, all of the nasty comments, the evil quips on social media platforms or on text threads or via email or on signs or in protests, the words that we write, even though that's not a tongue, but in a sense, there are, they would come out of the tongue if we could speak them. The words that we write, the words that we say, the words that we speak to each other, <laughs> yeah, it's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. And yet it's not just that. And he goes on to suggest that that's the same thing. And, you know, the insinuation here is to get a hold of it, right? So what comes from the tongue? Okay, I'm going to get a little graphic here. You have two hemispheres of the brain that are doing, that are working in tandem all the time to kind of make sense of your reality. And if they get rubbed enough, da 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 Then an ejaculation comes, and the word ejaculation means a throwing out from within, okay? And so they used to call, like, uh, remarks people would say, like, alas, he ejaculated. And nowadays it has more of a sexual connotation. But I think that this is really pertinent, and we'll come back around to it later on. But an ejaculation comes out, a spewing forth of some inner kind of fire or something, and out it comes, and there's no control inside of that. It just kind of comes out, and then people later have to kind of pick up the pieces of it. So the tongue, the words that we speak, come from all of this stimulation of thought and stimulation of the brain and the way that we look at society and the world around us. Well, the tongue isn't just a speaking instrument. What do you find on top of a tongue, folks? Taste buds. That's right. Taste buds. What that means is, Your tongue is much more, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, is much more than just an organism that shapes sounds that are coming out of your vocal cords. If the tongue weren't there, it is true, then the shapes of the sounds wouldn't show up and nobody would know what you were saying besides, um, 
Without the tongue, you can't really make many other sounds. And so our very language is shaped by the tongue, which means our sh- our thoughts are shaped by the tongue. And here's a cool thing to try for yourself. When you're getting stuck in your thinking, relax the back of your tongue. And then relax your eyes and your facial expressions and relax the top of your head and relax the back of your jaw. Try that out. You'd be surprised how much all this really focused, frantic thinking kind of goes away. But that's only speaking about the tongue in terms of its language. Think about the other side of this, taste buds. The tongue develops, and the, and the tongue doesn't taste everything. It really only has a certain set of nerve cells that pick up certain kinds of signatures, such as sour and bitter and salty and sweet and umami, and uh, if there's another one, I can't remember. And there might be a sixth taste now, according to some research that I've recently come across. And so there's a limited palette, right? Just like there's a limited palette of rainbow colors, but out of those come so many other colors. There's a limited palette of tastes. And then smell is really what informs you about what the flavor of things are. Uh, There are uh, olfactory receptors in the back of your mouth so that you can you can smell something not just outside but inside and picking up the smells on the inside of your mouth then lets you know oh no not only is this a smell but this is a smell inside so that means we got to prep the body for it in a different way so your tongue is this communicator to the brain about what is coming down the pike it's not only what's spewing out of you but it's also governing what's going in these are two sides of the same coin and we spend a lot of time We've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks even talking about language and how much that's informed and shaped everything about your life. And in that sense, it really can be this sort of devastating, ravaging fire. I don't know about the hell part, um, but it can, it really does control a lot of how we think. But let's talk about what we take in and how much is really, really, really there. Now, consider food, for instance. I really want to attack this notion of need from the time that you were young. You've been trained about not only how much food you need to have and what's healthy or not. Your parents freaked out about it. Maybe professionals freaked out about it. Maybe you had allergies. So there's been a lot of inputs about the kinds of things that you take into your mouth that are good for the body, how much water you should have. All of these things have been handed to you by other people and very little of it has been determined by you paying attention to your own body and actually listening to what is best for your system. Because you have to remember that an experience of taste is, by its very nature, a chemical reaction. And that means only half of that reaction is what is coming from the food that you are sticking in your mouth. The other half is your own chemistry. So the same food can give you a different response every time. And unless you've learned to pay attention to what's going to be beneficial for you, not as a rule, but in each given moment, then you're just obeying a certain set of rules and ideas that you've been handed. Nothing wrong with that. It's a place to start, but so also is crawling a place to start. Eventually, you got to learn to walk and then run and ride a bike and all the other things. And so there's nothing wrong with the notions and ideas we've been given, but they are limited. They're limited by the people who came up with the rules, by the research that they've looked at, by the cultural traditions that they've come out of, all of those different things. And so you've learned how much food you need, what kinds of foods are healthy and all that, all of that other stuff. And all of that stuff has built in you a sense of how much you need to eat and whatnot. But I want you to assess the notion of need. Some time ago, I came across a guy and I've been training with him now for a a brief period of time and I'm continuing to train with him, but who hasn't had food or water. I heard of him a while back and you may have heard me mention him. And there are others now that I've met as well who hasn't had food or water in like two to three years. And I heard of it and I was like, this is amazing. This would be so cool. I mean, you want to talk about emergency preparedness. If you don't need food or water, I'm like, that really simplifies your life. Think about it. How much of your life is controlled by the notion of how much food you need? Okay, there is the thinking about the food. There is the planning for the food. There's the preparation for the food. There's the eating of the food. There's the family activities surrounding the food, the holidays and the feast days and the religious festivals all around food and harvest festivals. There's the agricultural around. There's the cleaning up of the food after dinner. There's the washing of the dishes. There's the grocery store runs. There is the gardening on the outside right? And there's the reading about how to garden. There is the antacids and the Pepto-Bismol and all of the other things we take to deal with the indigestion and upset stomach. 
there's all of the marketing that's associated with with food stuff. There is the passing on of different food experiences that you get. Oh, you got to try this. You got to try that. There is restaurants and dates and outings with pe- members of the opposite sex or the same sex, depending on which way you prefer it. And um, there, there are banquets. There's family a- activities that are all su- for- surface around food. I mean, somebody the other day was like, don't we on July 4th? I mean, this is what we do, right? Hot dogs and hamburgers. Even if those are not exactly the best quality things to be putting in your mouth, like the fact that there's a tradition around it, you know, is it fruitcake at Christmas? Is it a particular kind of cinnamon roll on a certain Saturday? Like whatever else it is. There's birthday cakes. There's all the candy. There's Halloween. There's so much around food. Then there's the entire medical industry that is up and as a result of the fact that the food we eat is not actually our medicine like the father of modern medicine suggested it be. He said, let thy food be thy medicine. You don't eat medicine for a, like you don't sit there and be like, cool, I'm gonna eat medicine for food. No, you don't do that. You, you just, I mean, but people are doing it now. They take supplements. It's just a bunch of pills and that's, you know, a lot. But they're saying, let thy food be thy medicine, meaning if you have something that you have gotten sick over and you haven't been able to cure it on your own, then use food or some external substance as a way to help your body find its balance again. It doesn't suggest that you need to eat all the time, though I'm sure that they did a bunch there in ancient Greece. And I'm not suggesting that Hippocrates was somebody who didn't eat a bunch of food. But essentially, the food being the medicine, well, a lot of us eat food that is the exact opposite. It's anti-medicine. And so we have an entire industry of preventable diseases that are predominantly the result of the kinds of things we're sticking in our bodies. And not just foods, but other things, but predominantly foods. We're the only species on the planet that eats a thing called junk food. And yet we pay for it out the wazoo so we can have the junk food. And we do things that we know that like internally, we're like, yeah, that's not very good for me. But we do it anyway because we're looking for some kind of taste experience more often than not. So if you were to take away all of that stuff, all the medical stuff, all of the the pills and the treatments and the working for money in order to put food on the table and all the things that are revolving around food, how much time would you have in your life? Think about that. Just food. Just one element of your life that you have simply been shown or taught is essential when it might not actually be. What else would be possible? When I confronted this idea, the worry in my head was like, what am I going to do with myself? You know, how many times I'm bored and I go eat some food or, you know, the family activities are all around food. When you and I were babies, what, think about it, right? When the baby's crying, what do we do? We stick a bottle or a breast in its mouth and we give it some milk or some formula or whatever else is there. Uh, Food became a way to reward behavior, to train people this way and that. It has become a really powerful thing. And when we were babies, every time there was food, there was also another person around. So it became a way for us to connect for other people. So if you take that out of society, can you see how much of society becomes meaningless and useless. And then people would run around going like, oh, I don't feel productive because they've been trained that they need to be productive and they need to be contributing citizens of society. And the notion that like, well, if I don't need anything like this to survive, then I can just sit here and enjoy my life would make everybody feel lazy. And so then they'd run around and do a whole bunch of other productive, quote unquote, things that might end up destroying the environment worse. All of this based on a notion that you and I inherited about the notion of the need for food. So when I encountered this fellow, and if I do ever get him on a podcast, I'd, I'd be happy to get him on and, and interview him and, and kind of let you guys hear from him, his his journey, because it, it took a long time for him to get to that place. Other people try it a little faster. They try to fast their way in, but his whole approach was very, very different. So I'm sitting here encountering him going like, but don't I need food? And I'd been through nutritional programs that are like, you, your body needs protein. It, it needs amino acids. Where are you going to get these proteins? Where are you going to get vitamin B12? Did you know that your body makes vitamin B12? It's in your gut. Where did the cow get vitamin B12? If it's not getting it from the same plants that you're eating, where's it getting it from? The bacteria in its gut. If a cow farts in the air and you breathe that in, guess what? You took in some vitamin B12 and guess what? What you breathe into your lungs goes straight up into your bloodstream, bro and sis. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you ladies out there, bro. It goes into your bloodstream faster than anything gets into your bloodstream from when you're eating it because that has to go down through your stomach and then it's got to pass by the pancreas and down through your intestines and all that other stuff. And then that stuff has to pass through the intestinal wall and go up into the liver and then get into the bloodstream that way and all these chemical reactions happen. If you just breathe something in, it goes fast. 
which means you're nourishing yourself faster, which is why there is so much emphasis that I do in the retreats and have been for a long time around breath work. Not one kind of breath work. There are many different ways and approaches that I show people how to breathe depending on what it is that their system needs. But breathing is a very effective way to get nourishment. Wait, hold on, Bob. Are you saying I'm, I'm getting nourished by the air? Wait, I will get there. <laughs> hold your horses. Okay. So I'm asking him this, and at first I'm thinking, okay, but I need all these amino acids because I had learned this from other nutritional programs. And he asked me the question, he's like, what do you think amino acids are made from? Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and then some trace minerals, duh, like particles of gold or mercury or, or selenium or whatever else is in, in these things. But like there's all these little particles and stuff, and then the main constituents are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. What do you think the air is made out of? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Carbon being is in the air in trace amounts. And it's also, there's water in the air and water vapor, H2O. So that's hydrogen and oxygen. And then there's the environment, the, the atmosphere is like 78% nitrogen. In order to be able to breathe, if the nitrogen weren't, there, weren't in the air, we wouldn't be able to breathe. But all of the main constituents of these amino acids are there. And guess what? Water in the system. Well, when two amino acids in your body connect, the byproduct is that your body makes water. It's not that the water is out there somewhere. Your body actually makes it by connecting all of these other particles. And then he's like, well, okay, cool. But what, are, what is the purpose for humans eating? Humans are only feeding on things because we think they need nourishment. But what are these nutrients giving us? Essentially, energy, building blocks, constituent particles out of which to maintain the human system. And essentially, all we're looking for is energy. And when we don't have energy, we get tired and we go to sleep. And then we wake up in the morning refreshed and ready to go about the day. And all we did was lay there and breathe all night long. Isn't that amazing? If you or someone you know is looking to drop the F-bomb of freedom in their life, whether that's from past trauma, depression, anxiety, addiction, or any other host of emotional and personal struggles, but they just don't know how or want some help doing it, head on over to thefreedomspecialist.com slash feelbetternow and check out some of the things we've got in store for you or book a call so we can look at your unique situation and get you the help that you're looking for. So the energy that we're looking for to live can be gleaned from other places if you're working on building that as a muscle. But the possibility is there. And I recently listened to some really long, fascinating descriptions of, of real breakthroughs in, in, in physics and unifying some of the Newtonian physics at the macro level with the quantum physics at the micro level and discussing mechanisms by which the human system actually can produce a kind of photosynthesis, which is amazing and also different phases of water that enable things to start to happen. And I'm looking, looking at this going, wow, this guy picked up on something that's been some old age practices, and we're just now coming around the corner with some of our science to be able to make that seem like a possibility. It's always been a possibility, but our own thinking process has commanded our bodies to not make it a possibility. The nocebo effect, and we've talked about this before, but I want you to always remember that placebo and nocebo are just two fancy words, Latin in origin, that essentially say that your body will do whatever your brain thinks. Every time you grab onto a thought, every time you hold a thought as a true, your body will manifest that immediately in the way that your body can produce it. And if you do it over time, it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger as a result. This is what the law of attraction is sort of based on along with some other ideas that, you know, I, I look at it and I go, I don't really know that that's accurate or not accurate. But in a very real way, your body is producing this. So if your body says, it's not possible for me to live without food, you will starve and die if you do, if you try. So all of us sitting here saying, oh, Jesus, he went 40 days and 40 nights, but that's Jesus, we can't do that. But there have been records and documents of people who've gone far longer than 40 days and 40 nights. And my teacher also going two or three years so far without food or water. So for him, he calls it a breatharianism, right? His name is Elitom Elamin. That's a, that's a name that he received later on in his life. He was an American, started out, you know, 200 pounds, a high blood pressure, overweight, wanting to get a hold of his health. He started into some basic practices to start to build um, his energy in his body, which are rooted in Tai Chi and some of the stuff that I trained when I was younger. And meditation, meditation being this sort of like foundation, relaxing the body so that you're not wasting extra energy. 
And then he started with veganism and, and some sort of like live and raw foods. And then slowly, slowly, as time went on, his desire for the food disappeared because he was noticing that eating the food was draining him. Have you guys ever heard of a food coma? Have you ever seen what happens after people eat? We're eating food in order to sustain our bodies, but we eat it and then it drains our bodies because it takes a lot of energy to process food. And certain foods take more energy, certain foods take less energy. It just depends. You got to pay attention in your system to how that works. So here you are consuming food because you think it's sustaining your life and it's actually draining you of the very life you want to experience. That's the possibility that food brings. It actually has the possibility to imprison you if you're not very, very aware of it. So we think we need this food, but there are people out there demonstrating that it isn't necessary at all, only if you're learning to operate your system at a higher level or in a different way, which brings us back down to this sort of like human possibility. There is no one way that humans are supposed to function, but there are ways that humans can function if it interests you to function that way. For him, it was very interesting. He's exploring these possibilities and these ideas. And as I've been learning from him, I've noticed some things. So I myself have started going longer periods where I'm not eating food or water because I was so tyrannized in the past. Like, I need to be drinking this much water. Just like, I need to be sleeping this much in order for it to be okay. Forgetting that the people saying that don't really know much. They're making conclusions based on data that's very, very limited, based on a lot of people who have inherited a cultural heritage that has taught them that they're dependent on so many things. And so I was having a hard time. And I, I went four days without food or water. And in the process, I started like really feeling some differences in my body and noticing like I wasn't, I wasn't really hungry at all. I just thought that I was supposed to be hungry because certain times of day that was there. Or if my kids or my family were eating, then my tongue would get in the way and it would be like, no, no, I really need this. But the reason I wanted the food wasn't because of the food itself. Uh, I heard something a little bit ago that suggested that people really only taste the first two, three bites of their food. And then after that, it like the brain normalizes it and it's no longer a, a nice taste experience. So I started seeing food as an experience. And if I just taste this, it's okay. Now I'm not food free. I'm not water free at this point. I'm working toward toward that right now at the moment. If, if it still interests me in a year, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> but it says, if I see food as an experience instead of as a necessity, things change. And what I noticed was my desires around food predominantly were I wanted to be included in a group and they're all eating and I want to be part of the group. Or, oh man, that food reminds me of this great memory and I want to feel that memory again. So I'm going to go back and I'm eating the food. And it's never the same. It never tastes the same. I'm always trying to taste the first experience with it. <laughs> it never tastes like the first experience. But it's, it's the desire to have an emotional experience or a memory of it. It is, oh yeah, I feel my stomach bag shrinking. Oh, is that empty? Oh no, maybe that means I'm hungry. And so I'm not sure if I'm hungry. And so there's so many different reasons why food came up and it, it was almost entirely emotional. And I found that my body, my body adapted really quickly to not really needing much. You know, I was eating every couple of days and then I would have drink. I, I really got into guava juice for a while, but it stopped me up. <laughs> so that was juicy. And then I was, you know, having, but then, but like the urine and the defecation, they weren't having any issues while I was having this. So it wasn't like I was all dried out. My weight normalized itself. I didn't feel this like inflammation or like, you know, indigestion or any of the stuff that was going on, obviously. And there've been a lot of research around fasting and how much fasting can change and has tremendous health benefits. Intermittent fasting is a big thing nowadays. And I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't fast. What I'm suggesting is that you address the notion of need and tame the tongue. Your tongue, the language you speak, and its concepts are creating in you the needs that you think you have, right? And food is a very, very tangible way of really looking at that. How much food you actually need is dictated, one, by biology, but two, by your thought process. And that thought process is something that you've inherited that can be challenged. You know, oh, this food is so yummy. Is it really yummy? Have you even thought to ask yourself the question, do I actually like this thing as much as I say I do? Just start challenging your own authority on that and start looking at it. And as I've done that, it's really shown me in some big ways how much craving there is that is based solely on the notion of I want a taste of something. I don't actually want it in my belly. Sometimes I want the feeling of a full stomach. 
but mostly it's the, the flavor. Like there's a yearning for the flavor and that is in the tongue. And if that goes away, which by the way, Eli Tom, it took him like 18 years to get to that point, right? So, and he did it slowly. He wasn't trying to force it. He was like, when the desire goes away, it'll go away. Because if I'm suppressing the desire for food, then all I'm doing is creating a problem later on down the road. And I will leave this practice. He's like, I just wanted it to go away on its own naturally if it ever did. And so somebody asked him, why did it take him so long? He's like, because I had things I wanted to experience. There was a period of time where he was like ODing on avocado. And then he would go off food for a while. And then he came back on and was like, oh, dark chocolate, you know? And and so it was on and off for a bit. And then every now and again, he'd be like, oh no, I fell off the wagon and stuff. And dealing with all the emotional components. Our emotions are the things that are basically the manifestation of our mental attachments to what we think we need. And it's time that you and I address the notions of need that we inherited. Here are some of them. Food is a big one. And I've been talking about that today because it's very tangible and it's something I've been experimenting with. And I'm letting you in on the journey early. So you can ask about it later if we meet. You come to the one of the retreats, you want to know how it's going. But I'm letting you in on this notion early so that you can see like, look, I'm just exploring with things and I'm not perfect. And I'm, but I'm, I'm in the process of challenging the things that have kept me shackled. The name that we, we gave the retreats that we were running for men was unshackled in the beginning. I think we're just going to change it to freedom retreats, <laughs> just kind of use it universally. But the idea here is that I'm still challenging these things. Well, what are some other ones? Water. That's a big one. Um, and shelter, that's a big one. But there are yogis in the Himalayas that sit out there in the wintertime in like very oxygen deprived stuff that just sit there and meditate all day and they're not freezing. Tumo meditation, the stuff that Wim Hof brought to the West, all this stuff that Alexandra David Neal, I think is her name, that went out there and learned. All of these things are meditative breathing practices that controlled the temperature of the body to where she wasn't ravaged by the ele elements while being out there in Tibet. These are, these are possibilities for human life, but we haven't learned them. Just like babies haven't initially learned how to control their poop. It just comes out and their pee just comes out. It has to be trained, meaning it has to be brought to the conscious level and then trained. So you're not going to get out of the need for food and water and shelter just by, wow, it's really possible. The question may start the journey, but you have to train your system to take care of itself. Right now, you and I are relying on outside crutches to maintain our life. And the more that we tap into what's possible for human life, the more it seems that it is entirely self-sufficient and that everything you have ever needed in order to survive is already born with you, that you really do have nothing to fear and never have. The fears that you've had, the fears that I've had are things we inherited by people who had some crazy cooked up ideas that were passed on over time, modified over the course of centuries and millennia or whatever else, indoctrinated and institutionalized in society and then defended to tooth and nail by the people who believe that they are the truth and so on and so forth. And all of that gets to be questioned. You get to question the notion of your needs and especially in your relationships. Oh, my needs aren't being met. What if you don't have any needs? What if all of your life long, all this thought process that you need something from the outside to feel happy, to feel safe, to feel secure, to feel full, to feel satiated, to feel energy, to feel motivated, to feel inspired. All, what if you don't need anything on the outside? What if the nature and design of existence is that you really are self-sufficient? And what if because you're human, that becomes even more apparent than it does for any of the animal species because even food becomes an option when you do it well. So at the end of today, wrapping it up, I'm not inviting you to do intermittent fasting or I, I would say at least once a week, do some kind of fast, even if it's only a half a day or you just drink juice that day or something, because you got to give your digestive system time to rest uh, and time to like revamp and recuperate. If it's always on all the time, then you're, you're, the rest of your body is being drained of the amount of energy it's taking to digest your food. So maybe a larger gap between meals. In yoga, they would say eight hours is ideal between meals. Maybe you eat once a day or twice a day, or maybe your meals are a little smaller or something, but do something for that for sure. But that's not required. What I'm inviting you to do is to start to question your notion of all the things you need. Here's a hint. In my family, when somebody uses the N word, I challenge them on it. And uh, we have to do either the young kids have to do a plank for twice as many seconds as they are old. So our six-year-old has to hold a 12 second plank and the older kids have to do a push up for the number of seconds that they are old down and the number up. So if I use the word need, 
I have to do a 42 second push up down. Like it has to go 42 seconds to go down and 42 seconds to go up. And if I use, also I do that with the word can't. Um, and if we start the sentence with no, without it being a yes or no question, like someone's like says something and you go, no, you can't. And then we're correcting people. We also do that too. So I have had some days where I've had some really rough push up days because <laughs> I had to retrain my own thinking. But do some things to challenge your notion of need and ask yourself the question, what if you, none of this is needed? Life itself is not needed. It's here. It's a possibility. And if none of it is needed, if you don't need to be happy, if you don't need to be alive, if you don't need to be healthy, if you don't need to be strong, if you don't need to be married, if you don't need to be single, if you don't need to be wealthy, if you don't need any of that stuff, if you don't need food or water or shelter, then all that's left is a it's you can have those things. Now they're options. It's possibilities. And now we get down to where do you want to take your life? And once you've learned that and the skills to be able to not be so dependent, the where you can sail on the sea of life is totally up to you. The kinds of adventures you can have totally up to you. So I've trained with people who can do telekinesis. I've trained with with uh, people who can do um, or a lineage where the main guy was like lighting things on fire with his hands and lighting up LED lights by holding on to them. Uh, I've trained with people who don't eat food or water or have had these transcendent enlightenment experiences. Those are things that fascinate me. But other people are interested in elite sports and high productivity in business and entrepreneurship. And you can do that too. If your needs are non-existent, Wherever life wants to go within you, that's a place you can go. And that starts by questioning the very notion of need. And that's it for today's Alive and Free podcast. If you enjoyed this show and want some more freedom bombs landing in your earbuds, subscribe right now at wherever you get your podcasts from. And while you're at it, give us a rating and a review. It'll help us keep delivering great stuff to you. Plus, it's just nice to be nice. This is the podcastfactory.com.